Well, hi, thank you for checking in here on the BDR Lunch Gathering videos. We're glad you're here. We want to let you know that we have quite a few of these videos. In fact, if you go to the BDR site and check out our page, you'll find that here under News and Lunch Gathering, you'll find not only the fact that these uh, educational web seminars are free, there is no cost whatsoever, but you'll find out what's coming up and a complete listing of all the different ones we've had in the recent past and over the past two years and a half. All these are good sources of information that I think you'll enjoy. So we invite you to check in, visit with us, and let us know how you appreciate them. There is a little button in the bottom here. It says subscribe. If you click on that to the little bell, you'll get a weekly reminder when new posts are made. And we, again, thank you for being part of our family. Meanwhile, it's time for us to get to our topic for today, and that is uh, protecting your transmitter. And Jeff Welton from Nautel is with us. And Jeff, I'm going to give you the very first uh, crack at this because you have seen so much of that out there. And where do we start protecting our transmitters? <laughs> Uh, I could have too much fun with this one. Um, I, I've got a side deck on my other screen just to keep me reminded of stuff, but uh, unless somebody insists, I usually don't bother putting them up here. Um, actually, I am going to... Do you have sharing enabled, Barry? I do. I'm going to just throw that monitor up so I can show that one um, just real briefly because I've got what I call the trifecta of getting the most out of any piece of electronic equipment. And this one is the thing that I see done wrong probably the most. I mean, there's a lot of different ways, I guess, I don't know, opinions, but about grounding and everything else. But uh, airflow is the thing that I tend to see that could typically be, and I don't care whether it's air conditioned or, uh, or forced air. But I, I run into a lot where, let's see, let's uh, just crack this into the slideshows because I'm like a fool. I put animations on, which I usually try to avoid. But um, what we run into a lot is this, where you'll have the cool air, whether it's air conditioned or just forced air with a fan, blasting past the air intake at 100 miles an hour. And you actually end up pulling more air away from the transmitter than you run through it. And I had one situation, actually not too terribly far away from you, Barry, um, just up the road, probably about 100 miles or so, where um, I walked in and I looked at that, and the transmitter was hotter and stink, and they were moving a massive amount of air. And I found an old hollow core door, like a, just an in, or a, inside a room door or something that was just leaning against the wall, leaned it against the side of the transmitter to make a baffle to force the air to go through it. I bet you 10, 10 years later, it's probably still there. But uh, drop the ambient or the uh, operating temperature of the transmitter by somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the space of about 10 minutes. Amazing how much difference it makes when you run the air through the gear, not around it. And I mean, I see Grady down there, and I know he and I have had lots of discussions on air handling over the years. Um, you know, and, and David, of course, it, uh, the, this is like romper room, right? It's like I see David and I see Grady and I see Jim and, and, and I see you too. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is arguably one of the biggest because we'll, uh, I mean, all you got to do is force the air through the box. The, the other thing is uh, barred air conditioners. How many people have one that uh, want to admit to it? I mean, they're a good air conditioner. They're a great air conditioner. But they're designed for offices, and they shoot the cool air out up high and let it settle down, and it cools things wonderfully. Except that transmitters typically have the cool air intake down low and the hot air exhaust up high, so you end up pulling the air away from the transmitter, not, dump, again, diving into it. So in that one, usually what I say is get a sheet metal guy for a couple of thousand bucks. You can throw some, oops, throw some sheet metal in there and uh, make it, you know, just redirect the air. That, that can be a huge one. Do uh, transmitters have any uh, airflow metering to give you a clue that you do not have adequate flow or need to change filters, et cetera? 
since we've gone to solid state, I mean, some of the old tube ones, of course, have uh, airflow, like the, the vein airflow switches and interlocks. They don't actually have metering. Uh, we don't on ours, but you do have, we, we've got ambient temperature, which is at the intake, and then exhaust temperature, so I can tell you what the delta is. And you can do that with a couple of thermoprobes or even a couple of cheap thermometers or thermostats, whatever. And any manufacturer should be able to tell you what the nominal heat rise is through that transmitter. You know, I mean, I can tell you for the bulk of our older gear, it was 18 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Um, for the newer ones, a little less than that. The efficiencies have gone up. But, but yeah, if you know the airflow or the heat rise through it, then uh, that'll tell you if you're moving enough air usually. And keep it clean is the other one. Oh, my goodness, I can't tell you how many sites I've walked into where there be a pile of crud or critters or bugs or whatever. And, you know, you don't get airflow. You've got a chance of arcing, but that, that's another one that seems to make a difference. I had one guy had water at a site, which is really cool. You don't usually see running water at a transmitter site. But he took the metal mesh filters off and washed them and rinsed them out and then beat them against the uh, side of the building and then put them right back on the transmitter. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Um, which way is the airflow going in that picture? In this one, that's the in at the back. Are those, those filters in backwards? They may be. I can't see them close enough to see the airflow indicator on them. Because usually the mesh is on the other side well these my... have a i can't see the, the there's usually a steel mesh a steel wire mesh on these ones mm. and i'm okay. seeing the cardboard but yeah mm. i do not know that, that those are uh those are not the american air filter ones that we usually use so i'm not sure jeff um, they do have the um wire mesh on the back of those i just installed some of those yesterday or the day before at a transmitter site That's there you go it's a good okay. deal so, yeah, but definitely with if you've got metal mesh filters and something, two things. Uh, number one, make sure they're dry. Number two thing, just as important, almost as important. Uh, metal mesh filters have are, are really porous. Uh, you need to use the filter coat, the sticky stuff on them, or they're not going to be effective. Uh, one other thing uh, that is made by, I forget already. Uh, whoever it is, just let us know that they're going to discontinue it at the end of this year. So, uh if you've got metal mesh filters on anything, stock up on that. There are alternatives out there too, but uh, just be aware that the the Easy Clean brand filter coat is uh, going to go away very shortly. And then keep it well grounded. And this is the one we could talk about this for days and days and days and days and days. I mean, and everybody Jeff, has an yeah. Before you move on. Let's, okay. let's talk just a bit about those filters a little more in terms of size. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I keep hearing from people that, uh, A, they, they can't find the right size, so they go down yep. uh, to get something from Home Depot that's close. And mm -hmm. so you have the question of what kind of, uh, what's the, the, the AEP, A, the, the American rating. Air Filter, AAF? AAF so and size. So typically air filters, the size they give you will be like, say, 15 by 25 is usually 14 and a half by 24 and a half if you measure it. So you're supposed to round up when you're sizing. So if you measure a filter and it's 14 and a half by 24 and a half, then you need a 15 by 25. And in the thickness, it'll be off by a quarter inch. So a, a three quarter inch thickness is a one inch filter. Um, that's the general guideline. We use a bunch of different ones. There was, for anybody who's on the PubTech mailing list, there was a great discussion on this last week. And let's see, here we go. Just bear with me. Filterby.com was listed as one, filterby as one word, dot com, as a great source for uh, doing, uh, oh, look. My Outlook site should not be trusted. That's good to know. Uh, but that was listed as a great source for custom uh, filters. Uh, let's see. Just taking a look. There was one other one in there, too. Um, yeah, because no, and that was Clay Freinwald. Whoever he bought them from originally was uh, gone. So filter by, filter by. Um, 
Then the other thing, like I say, sometimes you can also go up the half an inch and still cram them in there. So like if you measure 14 and a half or down the half an inch, so if you got 14 and a half by 24 and a half, instead of going 15 by 25, go 14 by 24, and you might be able to shove them in there too. So, but take that one under advisement, definitely measure the uh, bracket for the specific one you've got. And the MERV rating? MERV rating for ours is all MERV 8, everything we do. And discountfilters.com was the other one that does uh, custom ones. Hey, Jeff. Um, yes. Since I'm an ignorant person and I've often wondered this, what does MERV mean? That's a billion dollar question. It I was Merv Griffin, either. but that's he's no longer around. It's got to do with the amount of airflow through it, uh, the particulate uh, filtration. But let's just take a look here. This is what I like Google for because Google will tell me this stuff when I sure didn't know it. Uh, and Home Depot has their own, which is kind of confusing as hell. Mm hmm. So reports uh, filters ability to capture larger particles between 0.3 and 0.10 microns. It, it means minimum efficiency from... reporting value is what MERV stands for. Yes. So, yeah, if it uh, and, and it's looking at the 3 to 10 microns. So if you got a MERV 1 to 4, less than 20 percent, uh, MERV 5. So it's not even a linear number. So MERV 8, for example, means that from 1 micron to 3 microns, less than or equal to 20% will be stopped, and uh, 3 to 10 microns, uh, 70%. And I have had people in the past, because they were in a dirty site, go to a higher, dense, or a higher uh, rating, like a MERV 13, and you will starve because you are reducing airflow with that. You, you've got uh, less porousness, if that's a word. It is now. So, yeah, definitely keep that in mind as well. All right. Now you get to see all my emails, too. I'm not sure if I had any good orders on there, but I don't think I was talking bad about anybody today. Today. So that's the other one. And like I say, um, there was on that uh, pub tech list, uh, filters by, and uh, the other one I wrote. Much. Should Someone's been mentioned furnacefiltersCanada.com. Yep. From Brian. Thanks, Brian. And no, Ken's got the MERV rating. Cool. Excellent. And so Ken mentions in, the, in a direct message, and we'll, we'll do this. Uh, I'll hit this on the grounding. So Ken mentions uh, for keeping stuff living longer, get it off a of Delta power. And I'm going to caveat that a lot. Um, open Delta, two transformer open Delta, worst thing you can connect anything electrical to. And uh, I mean, flat out, if you send in a configuration questionnaire when you're buying a transmitter and I see a two transformer on the configuration, you'll get an email just letting you know that this transmitter will be shipped without a warranty um, because we won't cover that. Now, having said that, closed delta, I'm not a fan of closed delta without a ground reference, which is a thing. Uh, closed delta with a ground reference, whether it's corner grounded or center tapped, I don't care. At that point, you've got a stable ground reference, and it's just fine. So, uh, you know, and it's arguably as good as why. But, uh, you know, from, from the perspective of what we do, everything we do is phase to phase. So I'm looking at line to line regulation and then I need the ground reference for lightning protection. So if I've got those two things, then the rest is just details. The uh, Delta without a ground reference is interesting in terms of primary to secondary leakage. That thing could be sitting thousands of volts above ground. Yep. Um, I've run, but having said that, I've run into a lot of sites. I walked into a Y configured site once where the neutral was not bonded to ground at the pole pig like it's supposed to be. And it had 185 volts from neutral to ground on that one. So, uh, yeah, you can run into some really interesting stuff out there. Uh, what do they say? I, well, I always say trust but verify. I uh, tend not to uh, not to believe anything until I've slapped the meter on it. Uh, that that's also goes back to, uh, did you shut the breaker off? Yeah, I shut the breaker off. Let me grab my meter. Um, the three injury accidents we've had rated, related to electricity in the 30 years I've been there, all three of them have been a breaker that was off. 
quote air quotes around that in case you're not looking at the cameras. But uh, yep, so definitely measure everything. So well grounded is a big one. Uh, so what are wrong with these pictures? Anybody want to hazard some guesses? Well, we can see that the ground bar is not grounded to anything other than the wall. Well, at least it's not grounded to a PVC pipe. <laughs> I have a picture of that, that too. Yep, that's one of my favorite presentations. Um, so the ground bar on the one on the left is connected to the strap going down below. And that that's, uh, that's uh, I can't remember, I think that's Hancock. So it's a pretty big building. Um, one of the things that I really don't like, I don't like to see loops in uh, ground leads because you just made it longer and increased the resistance and the inductance, which means that it's less of a, uh, and, and again, remember, think of grounding as a voltage divider. So we're trying to make the path to earth, the low inductance or low resistance path and the path through our gear, the high resistance path. Then I want all my ground runs to be as short and straight as I can. And I absolutely don't want ground wire going through a steel conduit, which is ferrous, which just basically makes a big old choke. So that that's another thing, because for electrical purposes, it doesn't matter. But if you've got a fairly high frequency component. Now, keeping in mind, again, this is Hancock. So we're up, what, 40, 50, 80 floors up in the air. I mean, be brutally honest, it really doesn't matter what you do at that point, because any lightning that you see is basically shooting through you or past you down the building frame, you hope. The thing of not running ground through a conduit is interesting. Uh, what do electrical codes uh, say about that? And that is where it gets intriguing. Um, some codes don't care. Uh, NEC makes no spec on it at all, but a lot of specific counties will or states will have building codes that say exposed wires need to be in conduit. And in that case, sometimes you can get away with PVC conduit. Sometimes you can get the little nipples to make the conduit part of the ground, connect the wire to the ground wire lead to the conduit. So it, it kind of, go ahead. I believe the NAC ad um, addresses the grounds to be physically large enough that they can't be damaged. Right, and not, not so much that uh, how it's run. And by the same token, you could run strap and have strap totally exposed. So that, uh, yeah, it, it very much does vary from one place to the next and definitely is uh, is something that's worth studying up on. Let's see, drag that down there. David mentions some mountaintops with uh, groundless delta secondary, yes. And that, I would say, three transformer uh, delta without a ground reference is a scary, scary thing because you are relying on your electrician to put the ground reference there. And uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I walked into one in uh, actually not too far from where Mark's sitting uh, about was two months ago, maybe. And uh, the ground connection for the whole site, I was wiggling around, took video of it. It was uh, really kind of cool. Uh, of course, everybody knows what I think about compression connections, but that's a whole different discussion. Let's see here. What else do we got that I think is worth? Let's skip through some of this. I mean, oh, the FLIR, I love that thing so much. If you haven't heard me talk about it before, um, this is arguably, and I bought one, bought a new one because they gave me a new phone a couple of months back. So I finally cracked and got a new uh, FLIR. But uh, the $253 delivered tax in. And I mean, it is the best investment you can make for uh, protecting a site because you walk in, take a shot of the breaker panel. And remember, we don't need the absolute number. I don't need to know how hot that, that breaker is. I just need to look. And then I need to look the next time I go in and say, oh, that breaker got a lot hotter than last time I was here. Why? So, you know, I mean, having the absolute value, if you, uh, have the uh, non-reflected surface to you know, to fight the emissivity, then it's a good thing too. But even if you just have like a little X on the floor and every time you walk into the site, step on the little X, take a picture of the, the uh, breaker panels and make sure they look the same as they did last time you were there. Don't we also kind of expect them to all be reasonably close in temperature comparing adjacent breakers and stuff? 
Uh, that'll vary. I mean, if I've got a tr triple pole gang breaker with a uh, 30 kilowatt CCA on it, it's obviously going to tend to be quite a bit warmer than any electrical outlet. So, so, so that can vary quite a bit, but, but yeah, especially like the 120 volt ones, they all should be pretty close to, to ambient. Yeah. I would think that if they're uh, all, let's say 70% of rated load or something that they would be similar temperature. But uh, as yeah. you point out, there are a lot of outlets with nothing plugged in. Right. And uh, either way, definitely you're looking for hot spots. And, and like I say, anything that's changed since the last time is another good indicator. Oh, there's a good grounding question. John asks if uh, good grounding practice to attach a new service to a halo ring. And so here is the thing. I'm hit or miss about halos. Halos done right, if you've read the Motorola R56 standard, a halo done right is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Unfortunately, mostly they're not done right. Um, because you've got four wires going down at the corners of the building with the ring around the top, the, the green wire that attaches to all the door frames and tray and conduits and everything else, and that's beautiful. But those four wires going down at the corners, unless they're going to four ground rods that are all connected together with strap, then at that point you've got four different potentials when a lightning surge comes flying through and, and you've totally lost control over everything. So um, a halo, like I said, done right, it's a wonderful thing, but it, I've seen a lot more done wrong than right. If it was me and I was working with a halo, I would probably cut three of the strap or three of the cables where they go out of the building and just use one as the reference point. And that way I run, I'd really decrease my risk of creating a ground loop. So anybody else have thoughts on that? Because this is something that, like I say, that I know there's a lot of debate on it. I've given this as a reference before of uh, hitting a studio on the second floor above a garage uh, that had tons of RF problems. And in fact, Jeff, you were right. The, without bonding at the earth point from corner to corner, uh, there was um, electrical current coming up over the hill from a, th a three phase distribution point from the power company, uh, mm -hmm. cross country power. And it was going up into the room and through everything and back down and out. Yep. And once we had it, once we had it bonded, like you suggested, at the at the earth point with bond straps on all four corners tying them together, we got rid of that as a problem. Yep. And so that that's like I say, when it, when they're properly tied together, a halo ground is a wonderful thing. And I mean, it, it gives you an easy way to connect pretty much everything in the room. This goes but, back a long way. But I was working as standby for a local Class C, a, a, a 100 kilowatt FM. <clears throat> and I went in there one night, and I was walking around observing the transmitter. And I noticed the uh, bottom of the transmitter, foreign strap came out the bottom of the transmitter and went across the floor and went under a door. I think you know where I'm heading. I opened the door. And the strap ended. And yep. there was a sign on the door that said, caution, ground potential present. <laughs> i got to watch that ground potential. That's dangerous stuff. Uh, what else we got up here? Oh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. I was the one who asked the halo question. And, mm -hmm. the, and this, uh, the, our electrician who came out to visit the site, he has not installed the panel yet. But he was going to attach to that halo. So what should I tell him to do? Just put in the ground rod outside? Should I have him bond it to the halo? Should I ignore so, the halo so, completely or why? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have an issue with doing the halo. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, he still needs the ground rod outside anyway. I mean, that's just part of your local code will, will say that any ground, any panel needs a ground. That needs to be bonded to your facility ground. And like I said, if your halos each go to a rod outside and they're they're tied together in a circle, make sure that the AC ground's tied to it. Um, if he resists that, Article 250.4 of the NEC was changed in about 2010 to specify that facility ground and electrical ground must be bonded together. So that that's something that's fairly new. Now, going to quantify that because different states follow different renditions of the NEC. And some, like Mississippi, don't follow the NEC at all. They rely on state electrical code. So 
it your mileage may vary there, sort of like with uh, what we were talking about earlier with the uh, electrical and other things. But uh, but definitely, I much much prefer to have everything tied together. And if I can get it tied together at one point, it makes life a whole lot easier. So tell them that in addition to the outdoor brown rod, go ahead and bond it to the halo, but don't rely on the halo exclusive. If he, I mean, the outdoor ground rod's my first preference. If he's tied to the halo grade, I mean, this is relatively speaking, we're talking, uh, usually they use like a six gauge wire or smaller, which is practically useless in terms of lightning protection. So, I mean, you know, if he does put it there, it won't hurt anything. Uh, you are, I assume, going to have a surge protector in place. Um, I am going to. No, you got muted halfway through that. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll try this again. Uh, yes, I am specifying a surge protector, and uh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, this is a single phase transmitter that with the TPO in the one point five to two kilowatt range. It doesn't matter. Lightning is going to be at its own speed it's regardless. Speed Let me click forward a few here. I think uh, there we go. Um, okay, so I don't really have wonder if I've got, oh, I know where to find this. We're going to dump out of this presentation, Barry, and I'm going to grab a different one here. <laughs> We're going to wander into lightning protection now just because I can. Uh, let's see. First, I've got to figure out exactly what I've done. Don't get right. hit by it while you're looking. <laughs> That's my problem. See, I've got too many screens, and uh, that means there are too many things to choose from. All it's right. a shocking revelation. So bad. Yeah, that looked like your lightning fried your eggs, man. Yeah, no, that was just talking about uh, up converters. I'm not a big fan of uh, sample rate converters in general, but up converters are the devil's play thing. Uh, grounding, grounding, grounding. This one should do what I want. Hey, Jeff. Yes, David. What is the recommended? Um, depth that you should uh, take a grounding stake and hit it into the ground. Yes. No, but what's how well, how deep do you want to be? Uh, so the the ideal perfect solution would be to the water table. Now where I live on top of a hill, that's uh, 300 feet down, and it's bedrock for the last 287 feet. So you're not going to drive a ground rod there. Um, you know, you might uh, sink a well, in which case you're, you're good to go. But uh, the ground rod, ideally, I mean, eight, eight foot rods and put them double their length apart because otherwise you're just wasting time and money. And don't bond to the water pipe from the water company. And uh, make sure that the water pipe is actually uh, not PVC. Yeah. Now, when, when I first started, I was always told you want a cold water ground, especially in Manhattan where we're in huge buildings. You're yep. telling me that's not what I should be doing anymore. Challenge becomes, especially in Manhattan or in, on city water, you've got no control. Now, if you're on a well system, you can very much tell what, whether you get copper going to the well or not. But how do you know how much PVC is between you and where the water came from? I agree with you, and that's why in Manhattan, I've also said building steel is also a good idea. Am yeah. I not? Here we go. So this is the one I wanted. Uh, so uh, getting back to it, uh, and uh, yeah, building steel for a high rise is almost always your best bet for a ground. Um, you know, typically the codes have that grounded, and it, it's anchored way further into the earth than anything we're ever going to get with a, you know, with a ground rod. Not like they're going to let you drive a ground rod down on Fifth Avenue anyway. So, uh, you know, in that case, yeah, use the use the frame and use whatever ground the uh, building electrician references you to. Uh, the challenge we've got, and, and this comes back to what uh, what John was talking about with the or what we were talking about with the surge protector, is when you have a transmitter site. Typically, we build them wrong. We have the antenna out back. We have the uh, power coming in from the street. And we hang all of our equipment between them and wonder why it blows up every time the clouds come by. And what we're trying to accomplish here with the surge protector is basically bypassing our equipment. 
Uh, the thing to remember about a surge protector, and I don't care whether it's uh, MOV or silicon avalanche diodes, they're, they're bi-directional. They have a specific clamping voltage, and when that voltage is ex exceeded, they'll short circuit and shunt the uh, surge from one side to the other, regardless of whether it's an AC surge heading to earth or whether it's a lightning strike driving a bunch of current through ground with a finite resistance and creating a voltage that way. So that is why surge protectors are so critical. It's got nothing at all to do with the size of the equipment being uh, uh, protected. I mean, how many people have seen the wall warts for a uh, processor or an STL receiver or a, uh, shoot, um, having a brain fart, but uh, remote control, you know, like the IP8 uh, blowing the little opto isolators, you know, all that stuff, typically what will happen and lightning will hit the tower. You got this massive surge of tens of thousands of amps coming down, hitting earth. Earth has a finite resistance per foot, tens of E equals I times R. So you're creating a voltage there. And once you've exceeded the value of the MOVs above the power line voltage, the MOV, the surge protector will clamp and dissipate all that uh, energy, most of that energy, out to the millions of miles of uh, wire that the power company provides. So really, that's probably the most important aspect of surge protectors even more than the, everybody's like, well, it's for protecting surges from the power line. And say like, it can, but unless you're in a really rural area on the end of a run with an irrigation pump, which I know several people are, here are, uh, other than that, typically even the dirtiest power isn't going to have that kind of surge on it, typically. No. So yeah, the lightning, you know, the uh, energy coming back from the antenna is really what we're decoupling here. And the goal is to make it go past our gear, not through our gear. So that, what that's, is, yeah. What is what is the life of an MOV? So that varies. MOV is a finite rating. It's what we call a cumulative decay device. So you've got X number of joules it will absorb. This strike might be 100 joules. That strike might be 1,000 joules. If it's got a 5,000 joule rating on the strike that takes it to 5,001 or higher, it will short. 100% of the time, they'll fail short. That's why you got to fuse them and not with a 5 16 inch bolt. Um, and, and Mark's laughing, but I have seen that before. We got one back from a customer once. He goes, surge protector failed. I want a warranty replacement. Well, it, we use a, a NEMA case. It's a, let's see, that might be one of ours right there, the old ones. Yeah, it's 1 8 inch steel, and it had bowed the front of that chassis out by three inches. Because when we opened it up, all three of the 40 amp uh, paper fuses had 5 16 inch bolts in them. And I may have the actual measurement of the bolt wrong. But anyway, a bolt handles a lot more current than 40 amps. So when the MOVs hit their surge absorbing capability and shorted, there was nothing to uh, break and pull them off the line. So the next step was they exploded quite violently. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, the energy they'll absorb is finite, and it is specific to the individual MOV. So is that a ground at the, on the bottom of that box? Yep. And it's, and it's all, going through a conduit. Uh-huh. It's mm. going through a big old choke, and it's got a big old loop on it. Mm -hmm. so, and it's in a compression connector, so you got the trifecta of things I don't like right there. Uh, yeah, my preference for ground, by and large, if I have the option at all, and I get it, sometimes you don't. Um, when I've got the option, I prefer strap. Um, two reasons, because they're, although the bulk of the energy in a lightning strike is in the 10 to 20 kilohertz range, there is a high frequency component, especially on a tower strike, because the antenna will tend, when you hit it with a lot of uh, energy, will tend to oscillate at the frequency it's tuned to. So you are running a fairly high frequency ripple down there. And that in, in that case, skin effect comes into play. The uh, inductance based on the uh, specific uh, cross-sectional area of the wire, all kinds of cool stuff. So, yeah, I like strap. And a four-inch copper strap, or sorry, a two-inch copper strap has more surface area than a four-aught cable. And uh, also, a, let's see if I remember this right, and I've got to look it up every time, but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by guessing by golly so somebody can look it up later and call me on it if I'm wrong. But a two-gauge cable typically has about a 0 0.15, 0 0.16 ohms per foot resistance. 
whereas a strap is typically in the 0.0015 to 1.6 ohms per foot. So um, that's the other reason. Again, voltage divider theory. So if one, something's got one one hundredth of the resistance for any given length, I'd prefer to use that. Any other thoughts, comments? Not sure what else do I have in here that looks intriguing. Yeah, I mean, this one is the big one, because I say this is the gold standard of what we're trying to get to. And I've got an AM site shown here, but AM, FM, TV, cell, doesn't matter. The, the concept doesn't change. Um, let's see, we've got the coax on the right, the AC line on the left. Uh, we reference everything to the surge protector, and that is our, our reference point, our ground for the facility. Right. Okay, you were talking about, or about to talk about pest control. I was. Let me flick back to that one. The the big thing on pest control, too, is, I mean, everybody knows that uh, you use the expanding foam and the steel wool, but don't use regular steel wool. Use uh, the, um, the, what do you call it, uh, stainless, stainless wool. Um, you can get copper wool too, but stainless wool won't tend to oxidize and disintegrate as fast. And the best thing for this, especially if you've got a site that happens to be in one of those uh, areas like in a cornfield or whatever, where you can get in there and uh, just um, just shut the door, shut all the lights off, and then look for any air, any area where the sunshine is glimmering in from outside. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Um, have I mentioned that I like ferrites? Once in, once in a while. So now here's the thing, and this is coming back to what I was talking about before. If you don't have the grounding and the surge protector, the ferrites are useless. You're just wasting time and money. Um, well, you're not wasting any money because we provide them with every transmitter we ship, so you got them anyway. But, uh, but in conjunction, remember, voltage divider. So anything we can do to make our equipment a slightly higher resistance means that that much more energy is going to go the other way. So the ferrites help in that regard, you know, does on it, their own. Yeah. Does it matter where those ferrites are on, around that? Should that transmission line be in the absolute middle of those ferrites? I mean, yeah, it like if, it, I mean it doesn't if, make if, any difference. I've, I've wondered that, you know, on a horizontal oh, run, for example. If you did the math on it, I mean, there would be a slight difference. Having it centered is optimal, but it's such a minuscule amount that it's really kind of irrelevant. Okay. Uh, the one thing, and, and I called Kevin out on this, and uh, but I put his name up there for future reference. Um, having the ferrites spaced apart is better than having them together. What he has there isn't two ferrites, it's one ferrite. Now, it might be one ferrite that's one in 10% higher than the original value, but uh, but yeah, spacing them apart a little bit more is, is optimal. Hey Jeff, does uh, ferrite ever change value? Theoretically, it could. I mean, it, it's basically it's iron filings, carbon, and an epoxy base to hold it all together. So you would have to hit it pretty hard. Now, the one value I've seen it change is if you really saturate it hard it'll tend to explode. Um, so it changes its physical properties quite dramatically. But as far as changing the inductor value of it, I, that'd be a hard thing to convince me that that could happen. Uh, I think if, like, if I had a wire wound around a ferrite, then the wire over time as it compressed the insulation and moved closer or further away from the ferrite would have more to do with changing the inductance than the actual ferrite material itself unless the ferrite's got a crack in it and then all bets are off. Well, they also have those snap-on kinds you get for like uh, yep. land cables and all of that. I, I just can't see how they can maintain anything because you open them up and dirt gets in between the layers. Yep, I mean, my preference and uh, Rich Parker, who uh, is with Coast Alaska, has uh, tested this before, but um, we've epoxied them together and always figured that was good enough. But uh, Rich did a test. He did a two-part epoxy on one that, that had been cut apart, and then he did uh, JB weld, and turned out the JB weld was a whole lot closer than the, to the value of the original ferrite. 
And let's see, Jerry's asking about any issue with the ferrite lying on the bolts, and the answer to that is no. Basically, a ferrite is an inert lump. I don't know, I don't think I've got anything in this one that shows it. But uh, when you've got a feed and a return going through it, like you do in a coax with a center conductor and a shield, as long as the currents in the feed and the return are equal, the ferrite doesn't do anything. It's just a lump of carbon and epoxy. When you have an imbalance, like on a lightning strike or a surge, then um, it will cause the ferrite to saturate and attempt to induce an equal surge onto the opposing conductor. So whether it's on the bolt or not really makes no difference at all. Are there but any... Are there any uh, chemicals that eat up ferrite? Like if someone spills coke on it or something, does it eat up the uh, the composition or anything? I mean, again, it's iron filings and uh, epoxy and carbon. So, yeah, theoretically there could be. I wouldn't want to hit it with sulfuric acid. Uh, if you I, had somebody sitting on your transmitter with a coke, you got to get them off. <laughs> this is New York City. <laughs> all, th all kinds of things happen. No, no, in New York City, the transmitter sits on top of your stack. I, I may or may not have uh, had a situation once where somebody who doesn't look anything at all like me spilled a beer on a ferrite once and no untoward effects were noticed after it was cleaned off. Is that Canadian beer or American beer? Uh, at the time, don't remember where I was. So I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. Is that why we don't see cans of O'Keefe anymore? <laughs> No, no, oh, O'Keefe. Oh, you mean Alexander Keith's? Oh, wait, no, there was a beer called O'Keefe. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I think that was an Ontario thing. Those, those guys, they're weird. Is lager worse than that. Pilsner? <laughs> What's that? Is lager worse than Pilsner? That's a personal taste thing. I don't even get into that. I'm a, uh, I'm that uh, red ale, Irish red ale kind of guy, so... I, uh, I don't because judge. There, Pilsner is a sub-variety of lager. Lager is a cold brewing process. No, oh, there you go. See? But, yeah, I'm an ale sort of guy, so I, that I do not know. Um, let's see. I'm going to beat the drum on this one for a bit because I know y'all, none of you are doing this pretty much. Um, but we really, as we're working longer hours and doing more of this stuff, we need to start focusing on the safety more. And I mean, I'm still reading too many headlines of people, well, trade show headlines about somebody doing this or that or ended up with this or that burned off or blown off. And uh, yeah, that, that's something we need to try to improve. Um, obviously, the grounding stick, I mean, especially if you work on AMs, that thing should be second nature. I had a guy in uh, in Paraguay once, a uh, buddy has called me and goes, uh, uh, is there any specific medical treatment for RF burns? And it's like, okay, I am not a doctor. Why are you asking me this? And it turned out that they had taken their 100 kilowatt down to do some maintenance to the antenna system. 100 kilowatt AM, they very dutifully grounded the output of the transmitter because there's a, a grounding switch at the transmitter output. They walked the 300 or so feet out to the ATU. He grabbed the base of the tower and discovered that the 200 kilowatt a mile or so away was still on the air. Um, so he got some pretty serious burns. Funny thing is an antenna will receive as well as it transmits, maybe even better in some cases. So uh, definitely that uh, that's something else. Like just, uh, again, like I said earlier, trust but verify. I, uh, I'm a big fan in grounding everything. Uh, BGS a bunch of years ago was giving out the little uh, proximity uh, volt alerts. I was just looking around. I think I've got one here on my desk somewhere, but I can't see it right off. I've got so much stuff. Uh, I, I collect all the swag at all the shows and then just come back and show it to our marketing guys and say, hey, yeah, we should do this. But I still, um, have, I still have a dozen or so from uh, Days of Radio Guy. Yeah. Uh, Radio Resources was doing this cool thing at uh, in Columbus. He had, or not Columbus in uh, Kansas. He had these little uh, pocket toolkits with like multi-purpose screwdrivers and jeweler screwdriver and a uh, little exacto knife and tape measure. So that was kind of cool. I don't know how often we use a tape measure, but every now and again. If somebody would like one, they send me some postage. I'll send them one. Now, hey Jeff, there you go. Yeah. 
those lockouts do a lot of good with the keys left in them. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, rest his soul, that picture came from uh, Mike uh, McCarthy in Chicago. And uh, Mike said, he goes, I use them everywhere, even when I'm the only one on the site. He goes, I figure if I'm the only one on the site, I can leave the keys in there. But uh, the, the purpose in his mind was less for the lockout and more for the slowing himself down and making himself think about, and did to I take remember. The, yeah, did I take the grounding <laughs> stick off? Did I restore that interlock I had to bypass and stuff like that? But you are absolutely right, especially if you're on a site with other people on it. You put your lockout on, you take the keys out and put them in your pocket. Absolutely good point. And uh, for what it's worth, those little lockout kits, Home Depot, 100 bucks, give or take. So, you know, definitely, again, the other thing I beat the drum on a lot is safety shoes. And this is something else that we historically don't do very much of. Um, I've got the, the picture showing on the screen. Those are my safety shoes, and that's the Canadian uh, CSA symbol. In the U.S., they're EH rated, is what it's called, electrohazard rating. Basically, it means that 18,000 uh, volts across the sole won't pass more than a milliamp. Now, a milliamp will still mess you up, but it'll keep you alive if you get across a, a, a plate blocker or something in a tube socket. Um, I know it will, from experience that it will save you from a nasty RF burn on a navigational beacon on an oil rig in the Persian Gulf. Not that I was there in person for that, but I was. Um, so... Yeah, uh, those are something else that I really, really uh, beat the drum on a lot. Uh, there was something else that caught my eye as I was scrolling through this. I say there's so many things, and I mean, oh, this one. Oh, my God, people. Why do I still have to have this conversation? So let's just open a web browser here. Is the browser showing? Because I think I just shared the monitor. Not yep, the... You, got, you got the browser. All right, so you get to see my Facebook for a moment. Cool. So let's go to my favorite Internet of Things search engine. Whenever you grow up. Yeah, if I ever grow up. I'm in radio. There will be no growing up. Uh -huh. uh, and let's pick, say, barracks. I should not be seeing nearly 1,500 barracks units <laughs> when I go looking on the Internet. Oh, so the, the general rule of thumb, as I understand it, is it's okay to do this and look at it. It's not okay to try to log into it. But the funny thing is, some of this stuff, whoops, I didn't want the search filters. If you get a barracks unit as an example that is pre-2017, uh, there was no default username and password. So if you had an open port, you would have full access to it almost immediately. And let's see. Probably shouldn't be going this far with a room full of uh, engineers who like to poke around with stuff, but here you go. It's still, it's one of those things like barracks. Uh, if you search Thailand, there's something else out there that uses the Thailand name. Okay, that one's firewalled. Good. But, I mean, so yeah, 1,500 barracks units. Let's take Comrex as an example. You can see where I spend all my free time these days. Mm -hmm. uh, 2,100 Comrex units out there. You know, um, let's go with, with Mama Nautel, nine Nautels. And uh, so this one I don't, so there's a Burke, so that's a Plus Connect unit. Now, some of the Plus Connect units protect themselves by default. This one is. But again, it shouldn't even be visible. Like, use VPNs, protect this stuff. If you can't see it, you're less inclined to try and hack it. But that's the kind of thing that we just see way too much of. And, I mean, it, it's it's going to get so much worse because things are really getting scary out there. Yeah, there is so much now. There, The hackers are going back to social engineering and yep. getting some really bad places. I'm going to throw a little poll up because we've come to this uh, point of uh, cybersecurity. And uh, it's completely anonymous. And if you folks would uh, do a little clicking here on the uh, one, two, three, four, give us some things. I certainly have that question on there, uh, Jeff, about changing default passwords. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told by one of the uh, gentlemen at uh, 
uh, one of the companies, I guess I probably shouldn't say, uh, that there is a group that has his equipment and uh, they um, they keep the equipment right on the internet because it's too e- it's easier for them than to figure out a VPN. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I do with the SBE is uh, I, I instructed a lot of the NS sessions. And actually, we'll be in Detroit in December for anybody in that neck of the woods. Uh, forget what I'm talking about, but it doesn't matter. It'll be fun. And uh, I do uh, a very brief cybersecurity, nothing to the level of Wayne Pacino or the folks that actually know what they're talking about, because I got drug into uh, sales when I got tired of setting IP addresses and transmitters. But uh, one of the things that I say is a general guideline the harder it is for you to get to, to as a user, the harder it is for the hacker to get to. And that's the kind of thing, like if I log into the network at the office, I will uh, open an app on my laptop, I'll log in, I'll hit the password, it'll send a uh, authentication to my office phone, which I need to use spatial recognition to access before I can click the button that says I'm approving access to this VPN. And that's just to get into the Nautel VPN. You know, I mean, now granted, we run a lot of stuff besides uh, a radio station, but uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're not multi-factor authenticating and uh, using non-default usernames and passwords, then there it, it's going to be an issue. It's not a matter of when you get beaten up. It's a matter of, or not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Let's see. I think those, let's do, do, oh, backups. <laughs> How many people do backups on a regular basis and actually have the backup device physically disconnected from the the main? Huh? You know, I mean, that's uh, I, I had a station in uh, Wisconsin not long ago. She and she said she goes, we always we do our backups Friday night, we back up the whole automation system and and the, everything and uh, all the traffic and billing and everything. And then the last thing we do after the backup's done is we disconnect the whatever drive they're backing up onto so it's physically not connected. And that person, whoever's doing the backup, takes it home with them so it's not even in the same facility. Um, Whatever Friday night this was, it was a year or so ago, I'm guessing, but uh, the the person who was doing the backup had a dinner, dinner engagement and the backup was taking a little longer. So they said, well, I'll just leave it and I'll pick it up Monday morning. And guess what happened over the weekend? Fifty thousand dollars worth of ransomware for a little unrated market uh, singleton station. Fifty grand's a big chunk of change. And that was after they hired cybersecurity firm to negotiate it down. Turns out you can negotiate with these people. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful, salt of the earth people. Uh, uh, by yeah. the way, it's uh, this is an anonymous poll. Uh, not even I am collecting who's answering what here we have about uh uh 60 percent of uh respondents so far and jeff you're going to find a couple of these answers interesting i haven't even seen the poll but i'm not sure where i should be looking i got more screens going right now than i got brain cells like i said uh probably should be on their video of the zoom Oh yeah, and see, I'm presenting, so I don't see that. Let's kill. Oh, that's right. For a moment. Let's well, stop share. There we go. There you go. And close that, and oh, I'll tab a bunch of stuff. One of the things that uh, we want to explore okay. further over the next weeks uh, are some of the issues on this poll. Uh, VPN, yes. Uh, Firewall appliances, yes, uh, and other activities. Uh, I think this is something that becomes more and more important, just like security physically, uh, which Jeff didn't really cover a whole lot. But I would wager, although I'm not a betting guy, but I would wager that many of you have sites now that you probably would not want to go visit at night by yourself unless you were carrying. Yep. And that's the sad thing. It used to be that we wanted to have a second person there uh, because of the potential of touching something that we shouldn't be touching. Right. But now it's the two-legged 
uh, folks that uh, could be a problem. Yeah, and more and more, I mean, the need to have cameras at the site and, uh, you know, and like I said, a camera is only good for re recovering evidence. It's uh, no good at all to keep you alive. But uh, but at the very least, sometimes it can be a deterrent if you've got enough signage up. Um, although that said, at a site in Minnesota a little while ago, they went in and they cleaned out every exposed piece of copper they could find and they waved at the cameras as they were doing it. Yeah. So. Yep. I mean, and again, at that point, the damage is done. You're already down. So, yeah, it, it's very much. And, and talking, it's funny because I looked at the poll. So one of the questions on the poll was, are manufacturers doing better? And uh, that was a loaded question for me. But yes. we're doing a little better. Um, the challenge becomes we can't do as well as we'd like to because we'd never sell a transmitter. Well, well, you're going we to you're, you're, you're like the last uh, question here. Uh, anybody, anybody else want to get on the questions? I'm going to close this down here in just a moment and uh, let Jeff take a look. Uh, if, I'll give it another 20 or 30 seconds in case somebody would like to uh, just give us their uh, couple of the answers I, I, I'm very uh, impressed with. A couple of the answers I, I'm scandalized by. <laughs> And I'm not so, scandalized by anything anymore. It, it's like I said, I mean, a lot of times it's a combination. We don't have the budgets. We don't have the education. We don't have the time, you know, so you do what you can do with what you got to work with and what you can uh, talk ownership into paying for. No, like, nobody, I, mean, I, I know there are some out there. I see Sean down there and I know he does a pretty good job with IT security and he knows more about it than I do, uh, which isn't hard because granted, I know very little, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, um, Let's so see. So no, Sean has the Nautel phone home feature turned on. Never seen a way to test it or any results from it. And nope, you won't. Um, the, the way phone home works is one way, one time. So every time something changes, it sends us a little data burst, if, assuming you're connected to a network feed that has outside access. Um, we don't come back. There's no acknowledgments, no nothing. So you'll never see anything from us unless you're on the phone with tech support and they tell you to go in and click the little box that says open a tunnel. Uh, and that was done. That This is one of the ways that we tried to keep the security increased a little bit. So, uh, yeah, because if you open that tunnel, you've basically created a Skype-like link that uh, will drill through almost any firewall, and that's just a huge security hazard. So um, it's now, totally done. now, you can absolutely call support and say, hey, I've got phone home turned on. Jeff said to give you a holler and let me know if you're actually, because I mean, for a while there, the server had been overloaded and it totally bricked. So whether they got it rebuilt, I think they have, I don't know. So yeah, I'd, I'd reach out to support and ask them because they, I know they did have somebody whose only job was looking after that server. Well, here's the results, Jeff. And uh, let's see, cybersecurity, I went with good myself. So we're all in the... Uh, in the, the better than terrible. Now, nobody, nobody thinks poor. I think that's good. So that, that means that nobody in this room was one of the 2000 Comrex units that we looked at. Good. <laughs> Firewall appliance, VPNs, NATs. Yep. Air gaps. Just using the internet modem. And all of those, the internet modem is uh, typically got a hardware firewall in it anyway. I mean, my, uh, my network here at the house, I run on mesh network and uh, my ISP, I have to actually open a hole in the mesh network for them to be able to see anything connected in the house. So that that's pretty cool. I do a, I do a um, showdown search on my own IP address and I don't, it doesn't find anything. I thought it was uh, interesting that uh, nobody is having trouble with IT. That can be a challenge sometimes, but uh, typically the transmitter sites, it's one of the benefits typically, not always, but typically the transmitter sites are left up to the engineers to mess with. IT sometimes doesn't even know that they exist. True. And in a lot of cases, although I argue for the IT security, sometimes it's better off what they don't know won't hurt you. <laughs> of course. I, I'm I'm encouraged to see that uh, four out of five will change passwords immediately. Yes, good deal. Uh, I'm not uh, not uh, surprised to see a couple of will get to it, but but that does happen too. 
Um, let's see. So manufacturers getting better at security. And again, this is the one like we, we've had requests about, and this ties into the last one. Um, we've had requests before to say, why don't you put a, a firewall or a VPN appliance in? And the challenge becomes that in a lot of situations, like in a university IT world, for example, they'll, uh, they'll boycott or brick anything that has its own firewall. So that, that's one reason. Um, there have been other reasons. It's, uh, basically, for anything we do, somebody will find a reason why we shouldn't do it. So uh, it, it's an interesting challenge for sure. Uh, definitely, that's one of those things. So questions four and five are the kind that uh, you could absolutely um, hit us with as much feedback as you could, because that will, over the long term, determine what we, uh, where we start to go. You know. By the way, my answer to whether manufacturers are getting better at security was no. So uh, just for what that's worth. Um, we are getting better at forcing you to pick a password on install, so that's a good thing. Um, something unique. Uh, sometimes we are. We still typically will have the default password listed in the documentation that you can find with Google pretty fast. And when I say we, I mean manufacturers in general. I looked up the... Uh, default username and password for a DAS deck last week. So, you know, again, coincidentally, I can't imagine why I was looking that up. Oh, there was some news article about something. They want to cost us money. But, but yeah, about, this is... Um, yeah. How about just having the uh, equipment uh, be able to restrict the uh, IP addresses that can access it or allow a range of IP addresses uh, that, it, that can access it? There are several out there, but again, that's one of those things that we've historically preferred to let you set that up through your own firewall. Um, there's no reason we really couldn't do it. Um, then the challenge becomes, you know, do we let you set up for everything in this subnet or just this IP address or just these five? So again, it comes back to making sure that we cover all the, uh, all the aspects of it. Uh, I also read something recently uh, that uh, the vast majority of cyber attacks are typically coming through um, the uh, individual computers on the networks, uh, typically yeah. through uh, oh, very much. email, somebody, yep. somebody clicking something. Several so times a day I get a thing saying, oh, uh, your, your mail is uh, too full. Click here to uh, expand your mailbox. Social engineering by far is, uh, yeah, click this link or, or uh, a secretary will get an email that say your invoice is attached. So she'll just automatically click it to pay the bill. And uh, yeah, yep, yeah, that is by far the hugest. I'm going to, I think I've got it over in my bookcase. So just bear with me a second or two. I'm just going to mute and wander away for a second. I'll be right back. All right. Well, we appreciate that. Well, Jeff's uh, running away. I'll uh, kind of ask a question here. If you can help us by recommending our gathering to a colleague, one of the problems I'm having uh, is that as the number of engineers, uh, the attrition rate because of you know passing away or layoffs and things, uh, we're not reaching the kids as well as we'd like to. I say kids. That's, you know. That, that's accurate, though, because, I mean, how many of us get into this job as grown-ups? Well, like we said earlier, I just chose not to grow up. There you go. But, yeah, and I the mean. Term of well, endearment. Term of endearment. Uh, we appreciate the young ones. We appreciate uh, bringing them in. And uh, I think, as I, I may have said earlier, my plan on Thanksgiving Day is to go back to that topic of finding and training uh, new ones. And so. Please, uh, if you know of somebody in your area, in your SBE chapter, uh, in your own station that would benefit from our newsletter or our gatherings, please turn them on to us. So what I got up to get, if you've got any interest in cy cybersecurity at all, this book will make you want to move to a cabin in the wilderness and not ever come out at all. So anybody you can see, it's called uh, Click Here to Kill Everybody by Bruce Schneier. 
and it uh, it talks about IoT and how uh, how we are really 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 hanging our stuff up there. It's a constant. Way, uh, it's uh, the constant. Also a way, yeah. It's the constant fight between uh, people trying to be secure and the net gods that want anonymity because they like to to poke around and yep. do things. Right, and the all it, it's the same old, same old. Like I said to begin with, the more secure you are, the harder it is as a user to access your stuff. So you know, by the only infinitely, the only totally secure system is one that's not connected to a network anywhere ever. Um, Harold, you were going to say something too. Uh, there's a, a newsletter and I think a website called Dark Reading that's just uh, all about uh, security, and I get daily emails from them. Yep. I mean, it, it's just amazing, like the the industry that's grown out of this. And, and I say that book, I picked that up in an airport somewhere. I'm reading it on the plane. I'm here to tell you, click here to kill everybody is a title guaranteed to get you some raised eyebrows on an airplane. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it uh, it's it, it's really frightening. And I mean, I'm probably relative to this area, one of the more connected households around here. I mean, there's probably 40 or 50 devices in the house connected to the internet at any given time, including my refrigerator. <laughs> you need more milk. Not quite that, but if I am in Columbia, Mississippi, I can look at my app phone app or I can get a notification to say, hey, somebody left the fridge door open. Well, I look... I look for someday, you know, for the internet to actually go down. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it'll happen. And, you, get... you know, and I, that's why I keep thinking to myself, you know, we connect, the majority of us, our stations are all connected via the internet. Um, unless there's some way to back that up via, whether it be microwave, satellite, or phone line even. Um, you know, it's well, even phone lines pretty much g almost gone. Yeah. It's almost all internet now, too. Yeah. Or cable, but same thing. Yeah. And well, I, I guess mean, like, we'll have to resort to smoke signals, I guess. No, uh, Russia is threatening to shoot down the Starlinks and other satellites and such. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was talking to a, a friend here and a new home uh, asking about putting up some of these new locks, the ones that are digital that as you approach them uh, with Bluetooth, they will open automatically by your presence. Yeah. And he's, um, he's Terrible a little gun shy idea. at that. He, Terrible he, idea. Yep. If the internet goes down, you're locked out of your house or, or worse. Or, or you walk up to your house, the bad guy comes up and shoves you into the door and now the door's unlocked. So now you're in the house with the bad guy. There you go. So yeah, we've been watching go. the uh, TV series, uh, Homeland and uh, people got into the, uh, embassy by holding up the head of the dead guy to, to the facial recognition lock yeah yep. or cut so, the yeah. enemy's thumb off and use it for the uh, the thumb the the fingerprint reader <laughs> right that now guy, this guy is took an eye and used it for a retinal scan right the uh the denial of service attacks and uh machines that have been uh compromised it's it's real easy to you know, yep. aim a million machines at some IP address and pretty well kill it. No need a million, but yep, yep, that's not hard to do at all. Well, we don't need that. We all we need is Mother Nature. Mary sent us this picture. You want to tell us why? Mary? <laughs> Maybe she's not with us still. I just thought I'd share it, uh, if you notice the grounding strip on the floor. That's that's what sparked me to tell my little story. So. Does it go through a door? I've not been to the site yet, so I'm not sure. There you go. Tell one of the spaces where I took I know there's another picture that had it to the bus bar on the wall down the floor yeah, so i I'll think to, this is a continuation of that one i'll have to make it a point to wander down there and visit him someday too I like the transmitters well of course i do i'm somewhat well, biased no i like the transmitters <laughs> yeah that's a relatively new install less than 
two weeks ago. I can tell the paperwork's still taped to the transmitter. Yeah. So <laughs> site's not totally cleaned up, but mostly cleaned up. Mm -hmm. The copper's all still copper color. <laughs> exactly. So now here's something funny. Don Jones back in, in the day when he was doing installs down in Texas. Every time he went in, the last thing he did was take scratch bright, go through, burnish all the fingerprints on the off of the copper, off the hard line, and then spray seal it with a clear uh, clear sealer. I mean, he so that copper looked brand new all the way right till the bitter end. I mean, it was amazing. But uh, that that's definitely a level of attention that we don't uh, typically have time for anymore. So now Mary's got a thought, and she's like, "Oh, I'll go down there and start burnishing this." <laughs> Hey, it's a short drive from you. It's just it next day down. It is. It's a short drive for sure. All right. Well, folks, I've got a bail. It's 415, but uh, here on the, the far east coast. But thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you for being with us as always, Jeff. Learn something and we appreciate it. Well, cool. Awesome. We'll see you next time. Okay.